from that point on, I felt like that was God actually really speaking to me and was like, Landis, this is what you're supposed to do. Hey friends, and welcome back to another episode of Called and Unqualified, a Create Worship Inspire video series. My name is Brenna, and I'm unqualified to be any sort of spiritual expert of any kind. And today we have a very special guest. We have Lannis. And Lannis, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Um, hi, my name is Lannis. Um, we'll, you know, we'll find out more about me, I guess, later on the podcast. And um, Lannis is one of the sweetest, most humble Christ followers that I've met, and I'm so grateful that you're working in the young adults ministry um, in our area because we just need a lot of genuine leaders because this is kind of like a rabbit trail, but I grew up in churches, um, especially larger churches like the one um, that our young adults group is a part of that weren't really genuinely living their lives for Jesus, and it was more of just like a friend group, which um, I think can be a little confusing to people that are seeking. So I am just so grateful for your impact and your influence and your time. So thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. That's so sweet to hear and just so encouraging. And hopefully I continue to live to up to those such high expectations. <laughs> Of course. Oh, and something else really cool I forgot to mention. I found out that you spoke a little bit of Arabic, too. Well, you probably speak a lot more than I do. Mahrabon, kapadik. Bihir, alhamdulillah. I probably have, like, the worst accent. See, with Arabic, it's kind of like, it's just something you practice. The way that I actually ended up learning was odd so my dad spoke a little arabic because of my grandmother who's egyptian and basically i got a tv in my room when i was 13 14 and i remember it was christmas and i turned on the tv and lo and behold what my dad did was he put the language setting as arabic and made it with english subtitles and I had no idea what I was watching because I was like, yo, dad, like, what are you doing? Like, why? Like, why are we doing this? And he's like, watch. In a couple of years, you're going to learn how to speak fluent Arabic because of this. I'm like, okay, but like, is this going to interfere with my TV? <laughs> like, I'm just trying to watch TV when I turn on the TV. I'm not trying to learn a language. So I had no idea how to change the setting for a multitude of years. And four years, probably three, four years, I actually probably learned how to speak maybe 65, 70% fluent Arabic. So I'm like, well, I guess it worked. So if you guys want to learn a different language, start with watching TV in that language with subtitles because you're learning based off picture, like what they're doing and how they're doing it. And it's just going to make you more engaged and you're able to hear the language when you're out in public and you're able to actually become more immersed in it and just allow allow what you've learned and don't be afraid to mess up because when you mess up it's only going to make you better and when you mess up with these people that actually know how to speak the language or where it's their native tongue they're actually going to be really 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 honored because it's not a thing that they're trying to get mad at like oh he's trying to speak our language yada 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 but in a sense of they think it's just like a form of flattery because wow he's actually trying to immerse himself in our culture and our language and to be more centered with us and a lot of people really appreciate that um have you ever been to egypt no i wish that's one of my dream destinations to go but i've never been yes yeah, I also, like, Lebanon is supposed to be really pretty, too. Yeah, I have a couple of Lebanese friends, and they, they're so lucky to be able to get to go to, to Lebanon, and they tell me all about it, and it's one of the coolest places I hear. So if you can make it there, go for it. Yeah, I would absolutely, like, love to go visit the Middle East one day. You... 
I can't, like, I just wish that I could vouch for that because, like, oh, I've been to here, 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 and here, and I've never been. So I can't say, like, oh, you should go here, 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 because I can't. But from what I see, and just for not only historical points, but just to be able to immerse in the culture, and I'm just one of those big advocates for traveling, just in general, no matter where you want to go, I just wish a lot of people would actually take the, more of the time to travel. And then when you travel, don't be the guy that's like, okay, I'm in the Middle East or I'm in Asia or I'm in Africa or I'm in South America. Like, all right, where's the nearest McDonald's? Find everything that we can do in America. And, but in a sense, be like, just take that week or however long you're there and just be able to immerse in that culture be able to really learn because I really think that would bring a lot of unity to the world. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it was really frustrating kind of going through Arabic classes. I used to be really upset with my ethnicity. Um, but um, I used to really be upset with my ethnicity because I felt called to work with refugees and for some reason, specifically refugees in the Middle East. And I, I'm one of the most palest people that I've ever met in my life, and um, I'm actually half Jewish, so um, learning Arabic has been really difficult because I have a lot of Jewish friends who are very traditional and prejudiced, and they'll turn their nose up at, like, why why would you want to help them? And it's like, because they're people, and then I have a lot of Arabic speakers that find out I'm Jewish, like my my roommate, um, when I was in Arabic class, was actually half Palestinian, and, mm -hmm. like, we didn't care. <laughs> we didn't care if our um, ancestors had issues with each other, um, and then I was just kind of like, okay, God, like, if this is, like, you create people with certain, like, DNA characteristics or cultural differences to just, like, bring peace and different areas of the world to like unite your people it's like that's fine but I just remember for the longest time just like god why <laughs> why was I given this calling and why was I given like this set of genes so I don't know it was just interesting well I think when you really have a calling and when you really become comfortable with who you are like the main thing is you can't change who you are physically you can't that's what god puts you on earth to be so it's like, okay, well, God, I'm here. This is what I am. And if people don't choose to accept that, that's more of an issue on their part as opposed to yours. Because if they're willing to just kind of cut you off and just look at you kind of like, oh, she's pale. Like, what is she doing here? Yada, yada, yada. As opposed to like just looking at your heart and what you're trying to do. Like that defeats the whole purpose, you know? So like, and there, you're over there trying to do the exact opposite of what they're doing to you. And that's the one thing, like, a lot of people just want to be, like, want to generalize other people based off what they look like on the outside. And that's, to me, that's the worst thing you can do. So you were talking about, like, just having a really powerful, like, just God having a purpose for like our small lives as a part of his big plan. And you have a pretty amazing calling. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that and some of your like educational background and where you are right now? Um, so basically my goal, and it kind of took me quite a while to figure this out, was I actually wanna be a pediatric neurosurgeon. So, I, when I was a kid, I used to be the kind of kid that was like, just circling through jobs that I found that I thought were cool. Like, I used to be, I used to want, like, my mom used to swore, like, all right, do you want to go to real, like, you want to be in real estate, you want to be a broker, that's what you're going to do in life. And I think I was probably like that till maybe 13 or 14. And then there were other times where it was like, I think I said I wanted to, I told my mom I wanted to be an architect at one point. Then I, I remember distinctly saying I wanted to be a firefighter at one point for like a couple of months. Then 
I think when I was little, I said I wanted to be a rapper. <laughs> then there was another point in my life, like the backup plan of like all of this, like, oh, I want to be a basketball player. And then it just like, it just, and then there was another segment of my life where I actually wanted to be a pastor. And it was like, I just kept going, 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 going through jobs and careers that I might potentially be interested in. So I thought I wanted to do something with houses. And then I took, I think in high school, it was the AutoCAD class, like building houses and stuff like that on the computer. That was the worst class I've ever taken in my entire life. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. I looked at the computer screen every period I had to go to the class and puke. I like, I couldn't, I just could not do it. I was like, all right, architect, I'm done. And at that point in time, I was like, okay, well, if everything doesn't work out, I'm gonna go get into real estate. That's just, that's just how I was. But at the same time, I kind of knew that being a doctor always kind of appealed, appealed to, I felt like what my strengths were in life. And to me, that was just hopefully just caring for people. I remember when I was a little kid and I used to be kind of excited when my parents and people got sick because I used to be the kind of kid that was like, oh, like, how can I make them better? Like, I wanted to be like the guy with like soup and like orange juice and like, here you go. Like, you know, I was like a little kid and I'm like, and just make, and it thinks like everything's going to be all better. But I was like, uh, at the same time, it's just, I was like, okay, all right, so that's a part of my life, and just, I feel like I just love people, and I want to be able to make the world a better place, and most importantly, I want to be able to do, like, what God has ordained me on this earth to, to do, and I remember, I think this was, um, had to be probably somewhere on 18, 17 or 18, I had this dream, and I don't know. Do you know who Ben Carson is? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I know this is going to sound absolutely crazy, but I had a dream around that time. And I was like, okay, I was in the operating room with Ben Carson operating on some Siamese twins. I don't know how this dream came about. Cause I, one thing about me is I never have dreams. I, I, for some reason, I just don't have dreams. I don't know what it is. Everybody that I know, like comes to me like, Oh, I had a dream about this, like every single night. And I'm like, yo, like, can I try? Like, I, why don't I get dreams? I just sleep. But I was in the operating room with Ben Carson operating on Siamese twins. And I was in the middle of this operation and Ben Carson looks at me and goes, Lannis, this is what you're born to do. Wow. You, you literally are put on this earth to do one thing and one thing only. And it's this. You're gifted. And just left the dream. And I was like, Ho like hold on. Like, how are you just going to say that? Leave me with these twins and like, not help me. Like, I'm confused. I don't know what I'm doing. And from that point on, I felt like that was God actually really speaking to me and was like, Landis, this is what you're supposed to do. And it's a hard journey because it, it takes forever to be a doctor. It takes forever to be a doctor. And I was like, my thing was like, okay, I want to go make all this money. Like today, like I want to move out at like, 23 and be on my way to being a millionaire all this stuff but god was like no you're you are going to be patient you're going to put in this work you're going to put in your time and you're going to be successful but when i say you're going to be successful it's the funniest thing because one of my biggest lessons in life is to be patient even though i feel like i am a very patient person I'm very impatient when I should be patient. I love to rush things that don't need to be rushed. Amen. I, I totally understand that. And it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, like, I'm just, I'm like, 
I just like, I used to be one of those people like, I want everything right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. And going down that route, I guess that's what kind of turned me off to being a doctor was it takes forever. But at the same time, it just made me realize everything that's worth having is worth waiting for and worth working for. And if God has put this calling on my heart and to be really be able to do this, he's going to be with me every step of the way. So even if that means that I won't be able to start seeing my financial goals until I'm 35, 36, you know, it's going to be worth it to get there because I want it to be where kids can really look up to not only just me, but I want to be the guy that's in the operating room that's saying like, look, like it wasn't me. This was God's doing. I don't know how I got here. I don't know. Like, I don't like, it's funny because my favorite subject in school was always English. So, and that was the thing that kind of just naturally came to me. So, but my brother was always gifted at math and science. I suck at math. I absolutely suck at math. I don't know why God picked me to do this, but I think it just goes to show that if God has faith in you and is behind you, you can do anything and everything. Yeah. I, that's just such an amazing story. And I would agree with you. I'm convinced that letters were added into math when <laughs> sin entered the world. I don't, I, think, <laughs> I don't think it happened before. It's just, it's unnatural. I, I'm not, variables are the worst enemy in math as far as I'm concerned. Like, I'm here for numbers and numbers only. I don't know whose idea it was to put X, Y, Z, data all this stuff in math like like no like who needs this nobody needs this <laughs> exactly so like yeah haven't you had to take a lot of math and science for your um you finished undergrad right oh no that's actually so funny that you mentioned that i actually have a couple more classes at community college before i can take to go transfer and i believe it's maybe three three, maybe four, give or take. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's stressful. Yeah. It's really, really, really stressful because my biggest thing is I look at my age, I'm like, I'm 23 and I'm not here yet. Like by 25, I wanted to be here, but I'm still here. So I keep thinking something in my head, like something's wrong with me, but at the same time, learning all these lessons that has placed me at this point has only made me a better person. And God's plan and God's intentions are, were to have me here at this exact point, at this exact time. So when it is time for me to finish my undergraduate, hopefully by the time I'm 25, 26 maybe, God willing, 25, I'll just be prepared for whatever the next season is in my life. Okay, so um, Lannis, are you comfortable sharing a little bit about your testimony and how you got to know Jesus? Absolutely. So I've always been in a very Christian Baptist kind of household, and my parents have always uh, influenced me um about the importance of having god in your life and especially my dad i remember getting baptized when i was a baby and my dad was just always kind of the guy that was like okay it's important to have faith in your life it's important it's important to have god and just being able to really have a strong sense of faith because i feel like that's where a lot of your manhood and your moral code comes into play is having a strong sense of faith. I was just always just in and around God uh, ever since I was a kid. 
and it just it just kind of rubbed off on me like my parents faith rubbed off on me personally but when it really came down to it i knew who god was but i didn't know god and there was the life changing moment for me started when i was 14 and this story i remember it so vividly like it almost happened yesterday because this was one of the most i've had i'd say two very pivotal points in my life when it comes to my faith in god and this was kind of like the one that just kind of just like kicked the bucket where it's like okay it's okay so i was 14 and this was when i was kind of i was in high school I didn't really share a lot of my feelings and emotions because that was kind of like, ew, who wants to do that as a dude? Like, that's, that's not cool. I was going through a lot, but I just didn't want to say everything that I was going through. So one day I, I woke up. It was probably about 8.30 in the morning. I, I just woke up. And here's the thing. I hear this voice. And... The thing about this voice was I couldn't describe it. I couldn't describe it in a, in a human fashion. The only way I could actually like describe it was heavenly. It was like this so baritone, smooth, loving, like it literally sounded like love in a voice. The funny thing is I knew like, from the moment I heard this voice, I knew it wasn't me. It, I knew it wasn't me imagining things. I knew it wasn't an angel. And I knew it wasn't, it wasn't anything that I was around. This voice was so heavenly and soothing and loving, I cried. Just hearing the voice, it made me cry. And I'm not a crier. I, I, I don't cry over a lot of things. I don't. But this voice just made me cry on impact hearing it. From the first word, it made me cry. And that voice simply said, everything's going to be okay, Lannis. And I was like, like, yo, like, like, who is this? Like, like, what, like, what is going on? Am I tripping? But at the same time, I knew that was God. That was, God was literally speaking to me just to say everything was going to be okay, Lannis it made me cry. So I go run to my dad crying. So my dad looking at me knew something was wrong. Like, Lannis, why are you crying? Like, you don't cry. And like, what did I do to you? Like, like, why? Like, what, are you, like, what happened? Are you okay? I go to my dad and I go, dad, have you ever heard the voice of God? And my dad looks at me and he goes, no, Lannis, why? And I respond and I go, dad, I just heard the voice of God and it's real. Like the fact that God allowed me, because there are some people that I've heard of their testimony where they heard God speak to them in like their heart or speak to them through scripture or speak to them through just actions in their life. It's very rarely maybe one to two people that maybe I've listened to their testimony that they actually heard the voice of God, like with their own ears. And I remember talking to someone about it and I was describing it as literally the only way I could describe this voice. It was heavenly and it made me cry just hearing it. And they said, that's the only way I could describe this voice too. And I was like, holy crap like i literally just heard the voice of god like to me that's the biggest privilege you could ever get absolutely like god chose me out of so many other people that he could have chose and allowed me to hear his glory even if it was for a split second and the cool thing is i found out when i was talking to this other person he said that it was he only speaks in phrases like short phrases and that's exactly what he gave me just a short phrase like it wasn't some long drawn out paragraph you know like three square thing that you send on your phone it was everything's gonna be okay that's it 
Like everything's going to be okay. And just hearing that from God himself, that's the most reassuring thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Just knowing that God is in my corner. And even with all the things that I felt like I've done wrong in my life, God is still in my corner. So that was when I was about 14. And then now the other part was, is more kind of action oriented, kind of more, I guess, exciting, I guess. So throughout a majority of my life, I felt like I wasn't too well liked in the sense of like, a lot of people were like, they used to tease me in school and all this kind of stuff for the majority of my life because of how I looked and how I acted and all this stuff, it really set with me. It really, really, really set with me. I remember when I was nine, I was nine. And I remember I said a prayer to God and I was like, God, like, I just wanted to feel appreciated because I never felt like I was there to feel appreciated. So I remember when I was nine years old, I prayed to God of like, God, like, I like, I want to feel loved. I want to be a ladies man when I grow up. I want to be the coolest person, all this kind of stuff. So I can get all this attention. Like, I think that would be the coolest thing ever. Lo and behold, (laughs) God answered that prayer in the most odd way. I was in high school at the time. And I believe it was my 11th grade AP English class. One of my favorite teachers. In fact, probably the, my favorite teacher. She was talking about like asking the class like okay what are your dreams and aspirations like what do you want to do like in life like what are your goals and keep in mind as a kid I wasn't the most physically attractive coolest kid in the world like I was like dressing kind of nerdy I was like trying to I was trying to figure myself out and figure everything else out at the same time I was in this class and I'm like For people that don't know, I'm a very shy person. Like, I'm very, like, it's hard for me to open up in big public spaces. Like, I like observing and listening to people before I talk or say anything. I was in this class, and I never raised my hand for anything. So that was a big deal in itself when I raised my hand. I raised my hand in this class and everybody kind of knew like who I was in high school and all this kind of stuff at the time. I raised my hand and I said, and like my teacher asked me, when is what, what are your goals and aspirations? Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a male runway model. <laughs> and what? when I kid you not, we so we have this like break this like 10 to 15 minute break in in this in our english class because it was so long i remember the moment after i said that we went to break everybody laughed at me every single person in that class laughed at me not one person believed in me not one except for one girl and the funny thing is at that time I thought this girl was the most attractive girl I've ever seen in my entire life. And I found that insanely odd, but she was the most sweetest girl, like down to her core. She was the most loving person. And she was the only person that actually believed in me. And I found that funny because I didn't know whether to believe in myself at that point in time. After everybody laughed at me, I guess people from the class started telling people from the school that weren't in my class. And I had a lot of people come up to me like, oh, Landis, you wanna be a male model? Like, well, good luck with that. That's never gonna happen. All this kind of stuff. And I was like, I felt kind of defeated because this whole, this whole point of my life, like up to this point, I was treated like, like nobody gave me attention. Nobody wanted to care about me. Nobody saw my value, I felt like. It's so funny. I, about a year later, I think I was 18, because I think this was when I was just about ending high school, just about, I kind of had like a growth spurt, and I I became much, much, much taller, and I kind of, I guess you could say grew into myself. I had a, like a, like a big head, a big nose, like 
big lips and all this stuff. And like, it just looked disproportional to me. And then all of a sudden, I guess it just, it just kind of came together. That same year when I turned 18, I had my first girlfriend because I never had a, I never had a girlfriend before. It just all kind of came in one big wave. One day I ended up going to, I believe it was grocery outlet. And I find this absolutely hilarious. So I was doing, you know, what 18 year olds do. Like when you're with your mom grocery shopping, like you throw stuff on the conveyor belt and to get her to pay for it. And I was just with my mom. So it's funny because my mom's kind of light skinned and everybody in my family's on the lighter, like on the lighter skin side, but I was the one who popped out dark. So, <laughs> so I was in this line and there was this lady behind me. I guess she kind of saw me and then saw my mom and she taps my mom on the shoulder and she goes, Hey, is that your son? And my mom kind of looks at this lady mad crazy because she's kind of like, we're the only people of somewhat color in this line. Like what, like if you were to take a good guess, what do you think the answer to this question is going to be? My mom was thinking it, but she didn't say it. So she was being cordial, luckily, because my mom is very, very, very honest. She's a very honest person. And sometimes, you know, I get the worst of that. But she was cordial with this lady. And she goes, like, is that your son? And my mom goes, yeah, like, this is my son. Like, why do you ask? She goes, has your son ever considered modeling? Here's me going in the back, in the back of my mom going, no, 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 no. Like, I thought I was going to go to college, go play basketball. Like, I thought, like, I was on my route of becoming a man at this point. Like, modeling, that's for girls. But it's so funny how that came about because I didn't remember what I said over a year ago. And I guess the reason why I said, like, over a year ago, that's what I wanted to do was because of how I felt. And I wanted to prove to everybody, I guess, my worth, I guess, on a more self, how do I put it? Like, a, like to prove to everyone that, haha, in your face, kind of, I am worth it, yada, 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 I am good looking, I am all this stuff. So in a way, I was battling my insecurity in that, in that department. She asked, has your son ever considered modeling? And I'm just kind of like in the back of my mom going, no, 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 don't you dare, don't you dare. But my mom, thinking the way that she thinks, she's like, well, let's see, modeling means money, modeling means status, modeling means all this stuff. And she responds, I've always wondered how I could get him into this. And I'm like, mom, like, chill. Like, no, 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 no. And the lady goes, well, if you're really into this, give me a call because I think your son can be huge in this industry. So I get home and I'm like arms crossed with my mom talking, mom, like what, like what in the world are you doing? Like, no, like, no, no, no. Two weeks later, I'm in this crazy lady's office <laughs> taking headshots, portfolio shots, just full body shots, three, four shots. And if you're like in the modeling industry or know of the things that take place, those are the main kind of pictures that you have to take in order for you to get your face off there. She was like, okay, well, I kind of want you to try out this show in San Francisco. And I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, look, I'm only here because my mom forced me to get here and I'm like thinking like okay like we're downtown my mom drove me because I still have my license at this point which is a funny story my mom drove me down here like the fact that we're in downtown and we haven't eaten dinner yet I'm hungry I want to go get food this is the only reason why I'm here we could stop this picture stuff now she's like well there's this show in San Francisco I want you to try and you know I was like all right whatever like just to get her out of my face I was like okay whatever it's cool so the next weekend, there's something called an AAU fashion show in San Francisco, where I probably had to be close to 250 models there, and I'd say 13 designers, give or take, and they vote, and so they vote for their favorite models. And I did the show or whatever, like, it was like, it was like a casting call kind of thing. So you walk down this little runway, you just show them your walk, and that's it. I walked on a runway, do my thing. And I'm like, everybody finished. So you get like a little number or whatever. And they, they vote for their favorite. Apparently nine out of the 13 ended up picking me as their favorite. I was like, 
okay, that's cool. Like, do I win something? Like, do I go get food now? Like, what happens after <laughs> this? So after that, there was a whole bunch of agents and designers that were out at this casting call. And they were like, yo, like, I have a fashion show coming up here. I have a fashion show coming up here. I have an agency that I want you to look into. All this kind of stuff. So all these opportunities ended up popping up. Ever since that fashion show, I was able to go down to San Francisco, then to LA, then it spanned to New York, then it went to Miami, and then it started getting global. Then I was able to start going to like Paris, London, Milan, all these different places, Sao Paulo. And it just, it just skyrocketed from that point. At this point in time, I was never like super big into Instagram. I've never been that guy, but I will never forget it. The first fashion show I participated in, I posted a picture from it on my Instagram. I believe it was 2016 or 2017, something like that. I didn't have a whole ton of followers at the time, but that was kind of like, I kind of kept it under wraps in the sense of, because I started like sort of goofing around with the idea of like getting into modeling, like taking pictures with my friends and that are very, very, very talented photographers, by the way. But I was goofing around with it. I never thought it would ever lead me to a fashion show, to be honest. I was just kind of like, okay, well, that's cool. And then this opportunity popped up and then it led me way farther than what I ever thought was imaginable. So I post this picture. I think I remember the caption being, for everybody who has ever doubted me, I wanted to tell you thank you or something like that. And I kid you not, that picture probably had to have had at least maybe 50 comments of every single person that has vocally admitted to me how much they did not believe this would happen to me, ever. So I'm not even gonna lie to you, I was on my high horse at this time. I was, you like, I felt like you could not stop me. I'm getting all this attention, like, I proved so many people wrong. I was, I was making all this money. I was getting in contact with designers that are of big brands and just doing all this stuff I never thought was imaginable for me. And it's so funny like that, I guess now it's kind of coming to me. Do you remember the story of Peter? And when pretty much God, he saw Peter, like he saw God literally like getting like crucified and beaten on the cross and everybody was like he was satan was like oh hey like do you really 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 believe this is your savior right now like he's butt naked you can't do anything right now and then all of a sudden when peter turns his back against him and to me a lot of people around in my circle were peters until i finally stepped forth and i was like look i told you like this is going to be way crazier than I ever thought. And I finally proved it to them of my work. I was like looking, I was like, this is like, this is crazy. I just never thought I would be like, things would ever be like this. And I was grateful, but at the same time, a lot of it was going to my head. I was a pretty good kid at this point in time. I mean, I wasn't, I was around a lot of people that wanted me to get with girls and to get into that worldly stuff, partake and partake in it, like drinking and smoking and doing all this. I'm so fortunate that I was never, ever into drugs. I've never done drugs in my life. I was never into all the, the sex and stuff. Like that just wasn't a part of me. And I was like, I was telling my friends, they were laughing at me like, yo, like I'm waiting till marriage. And then they just kind of just laughed in my face. A lot of friends were starting to drink at this age. And I was like, I've never been a drinker. Like I didn't, I didn't really want to drink. I didn't see the purpose in it. I guess as things progressed, I started to, I was like, you know what? Like one shot of alcohol won't hurt. Honestly, like it was, I wouldn't say it got so bad because it didn't get super bad, but I was not planning to drink, but drinking to me slowly but surely became like a fun social thing. That is not, that was not the route that God wanted me to be on. At this point in time, when I was traveling, I was getting invited to all these parties. I was getting invited, like being around all these girls, getting all this attention and like all this stuff. And like, it's so funny because that little prayer that I said when I was nine years old, 
it happened right in front of my face. This is kind of like the turning point, like for real, where this is probably the big part of my testimony. After Sao Paulo Fashion Week, they did like a big after party. And what they ended up doing was they ended up renting this yacht. They put it on a beach and they just had it sail around and it was just a massive party. And it probably was about 40 dudes. And I would say probably 200 to 250 of some of the most incredible looking women I've ever seen in my entire life. I go and I go on this boat and I just see terrible things. I was watching people drink insane amounts of alcohol. I was watching people do drugs, smoke, do drugs out of ungodly places and just be absolutely crazy. I remember I was sitting in between like two girls just talking to them. I was just talking to them. And like, I was just trying, I was trying to get to know them, have a conversation. And they kind of left and were like, oh, I'm gonna go hang out over here. Like, like, I'm gonna go have fun with those people. All right, cool, whatever. For some odd reason, I just had this weird thought pop into my head. And I was like, everything that I thought I've ever wanted, money, attention, clothes, just being a part and being looked at like favorable and like having all this attention, all of those things that I thought I've ever wanted in life, every single one of those things is what Satan sent to distract me. And I remember right after when I went into the bathroom, I went in the bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror. I looked at myself and I was like, I'm a child of God. What am I doing here? Like, this is not me. Like, this is like, all of this stuff is not me. So this whole time I was just thinking of, of how like I felt like a betrayed God. In the same way, it's so funny because God knew I was gonna do this. And it was so funny, like when I stepped on this boat, like sometimes I can just see God just in the sky, just doing his thing. And I just see him like snapping his fingers when I had that thought and he's like, all right, now. And I'm like, that's absurd to me because my mom has always told me I've been kind of a hard-headed person. <laughs> and I have to learn things the hard way. So when my mom was telling me, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't be arrogant, don't, don't let all this stuff come to you, God took the prayer that I had at nine years old, made it come true in my own life just to teach me Everything that I thought I've ever wanted were things of the world and of Satan and not of his nature. God put me on this path to teach me an entire lesson because I thought I wanted all these things of like just wanting to be loved and appreciated. And I wanted it in the worst way. I didn't want it genuinely. I wanted it just from everybody to make, to prove to everybody else that I was around that. I'm valuable and I'm worth it. But the one thing that I didn't do at this point in time was put my worth in the one person that it matters for, and that's God. I put it in everybody else. And when I put my worth into everybody else, it made me do those worldly things. That was not the path that God has put me on. So God taught me the hard way that what you are doing is not right. This is not what you're meant to do. Now that I look at it that way, I quit drinking. I quit going to parties. I quit doing all this stuff because that's not the life that God wants me to live. It's so funny that I like now that I really think about it, you know, when God crushing me in the in like in the beginning of my life of not feeling like I was appreciated when i think about it now it's like when you crush bread in a sense you're kind of multiplying it so if you take one big loaf of bread you split it into two pieces you take those two pieces you split it into four you take those four pieces you split them into eight you're multiplying your circumstances when you multiply things is an operation and when you go into an operation what happens has to happen to you first. 
you have to get broken. You have to feel like you're probably crushed. But when you go get operated on, they fix you up. That's the whole point. But in order to get operated on and get fixed up first, so you hopefully become better than what you were previously, you first had to become broken. I believe that God taught me that lesson and God wanted me to become broken first before he taught me this lesson and then fixed me up. So now that I know what it's like to be, I guess, feeling myself and becoming arrogant and thinking of myself higher, I have to remember those times that when I was a kid of all the times I didn't feel appreciated and how that made me feel. So now when I'm growing up and going through these times older, I have to realize that if you're going to be arrogant, you have to really think about what you did prior and how that made you feel because that was not the way that you wanted to feel. And you have to think about those things now because I wanted to crush you and teach you that lesson. So you can be around people and never allow them to feel that crushing feeling that you felt. And that's what I instilled in you. So you would never, ever have to allow people that are around you to go through that ever again. And that just led me closer and closer and closer and closer to God. I like hearing your story. It's so amazing to see like what God's brought you through, because I just think about you know, all of the other celebrities that, like, their lives are the testimony of, like, money and fame and attention isn't ever going to be a good substitute for Jesus because, like, it's so heartbreaking seeing how many people just get everything that they thought they wanted and then they end up taking their own lives. And so it's really amazing to hear that your testimony, like, didn't end that way you just saw that there was a way out. Yeah. And my big thing was this whole time I was chasing an insecurity, I felt like. I think it was uh, T.D. Jakes that said, this modeling stuff, I didn't want to become famous. That wasn't my goal. I wanted to be effective. The reason why I wanted to be effective was I wanted kids to look up to me in the sense of, wow, like all these people teased him, all this, all these kids hurt his feelings and all this kind of stuff. And I wanted these kids to look up to me that have a similar story to me and look to me as inspiration. And I wanted to be able to prove to them, look, it's not what they say about you. It's about how you feel about yourself. And it's not where you start. It's about how you finish because you can, you can start anywhere on on a racetrack and lose. You could you can be in the lead for four laps, sit there, drink a bottle of water, and watch the other person cross the finish line before you do. So if you're not finished, if you're not going strong or going harder towards the end of your race, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I didn't want these kids to feel like they're setting themselves up for failure because they weren't winning at the first half of their race. Yeah. And like it's just, it's amazing to me how God can just take some experiences that are just, like, looking back on them, just really heart-wrenching about whether it be, like, something that we sold ourselves out for or just some really awful circumstances that happen and just think about the whole point of God being able to redeem that experience to be able to keep others of his children from going through the same kind of pain, like to learn from other people's experiences. And I just, my thing is, I just want to be able to live for God in the best way possible. Living for God comes with lessons. It really, really, really comes with lessons. A big thing that I felt like I've learned is when you pass your challenge that you have in life at this point, you're rewarded with your next challenge. Absolutely. So did you want to talk about kind of like living out genuine faith or do you think that you touched on that already? Living out genuine faith, I guess, like, what do you mean by that? Like, well, just kind of like you were saying there was a point in your life where it went from like your posture almost changed from living like you knew about God to you knew God and you reflected Jesus and just that redemption and that love. Sure. Um, my lesson with that is 
when I said that when I still at this point in time and doing all of this stuff, I, if you asked me, oh, do you believe in God? I'd be like, of course, I'm Christian, like all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, how am I living out for God if I'm being arrogant and self-centered and partying all the time? And, and at this point in time, I probably like, I rarely went to church, but I felt like I had a relationship with God. But my relationship with God was like, I'd say on the rocks. When I say on the rocks, it's not that I didn't love him or I didn't want to be, or I didn't know who God was. It was in the actions that I was doing. And with the actions that I was doing was I was literally going against his word without my knowledge because I wasn't in my word every single day. I was just saying, just claiming like, oh, I believe in God, X, Y, and Z, even though, like I said, he was a big, he's a big part of my life, but I was straying away from it. So God had to really cut off all this stuff in my life to bring me back home. That those experiences made me want to go into my word every day. Look at the content and the people and everything that I was surrounding myself with. Because I was surrounding myself with people that wanted to do all these things in the world all the time. And I was, I was for it. I was like, oh, you want to go to a party? Let's go. Like, oh, do you want to go drink? Like, let's go. Like, oh, do you want to do all this other stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. Let's go. But at the same time, I just think of God looking down at me like, like a very disappointed parent, like, man, I love this kid, but he is disobeying me in so many ways right now. And I hope that he comes back home and comes back to his senses about who he is and who he's a child of. I remember my dad, he always told me that Satan will always give you the most fun in the moment, but the morning you wake up, you'll instantly regret it. That's something that pertained to a lot of me and a lot of things of, of the world right now. Like you could talk about drinking. It's fun in the moment, but then when you wake up, you have a massive hangover or you can talk about like doing drugs. I've never done it, but I'm sure in the moment it's fun, like being high is fun and you could just tune out everything and it feels great. But when you wake up, man, I shouldn't have smoked. That's not a good idea. Or you could talk about having sex, like, man, like that was great in the moment. And then right at the end, you're like, man, why do I feel this shame and regret? And you look at the next person over and it's like, I could have did something really productive with my night instead of doing all of those things and end up just to end up regretting it. Yeah. And like, even after a while, like seeking to be like emotionally filled by all of those things, you just, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but like when I feel really far from God, I like almost feel like a walking empty shell of like a person. Like, I don't even like, I feel like a stranger to myself because I've lost that essential part of my identity. Like, I don't know who I am. 150%, like, that's, I feel like that's God speaking to you, saying, hey, like, you're going a little bit too far from me right now. I need you to come back. Having that feeling just makes you feel like one of the worst people on the planet. Because you, you are actually hearing God speak to you. And that's an incredible, that's an incredible thing on itself. Because it's the ones that, uh, as I believe, that's, uh, there's a certain Bible verse I'm thinking of right now, but I don't want to misquote it, so I'm not going to say it, but, uh, or say the, the verse name, but I believe it's, it's the ones that have the closest relationship with God are the ones that hear me the most. When we hear him, we should look at that as a privilege. And a lot of people don't look at it as a privilege because they're like, God, I want to go have fun. Like, I want to go, I want to go party with my friends. I want to go drink. I want to go have fun with girls and all this stuff. But they're not looking at it as a eternal thing. They're looking at it as a now thing because their repercussions eventually will catch up with them. It may not catch up with them here on earth, but when it is judgment day, eventually it will, it will really, really, really catch up. And then you're confronted with all of these things that you've done and all these sins that you've done and you're like man there's an eternal party up in heaven that i could have been invited to 
but I did all these little things just to have fun here on earth. But in reality, the real party's in heaven and I'm missing out right now. Like, I like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to go to a nice party. Like I, I like when I go to heaven or when I like, if, when I imagine myself going to heaven, I want the grand entrance. I don't want the little sneak me in the back door kind of thing. I want the real thing. Like, I want God to look at me and it goes, Landis, I'm so proud of you. The way that I was living, I was straying from that. And I just, and I knew from that point on, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with you when you were saying like, God speaking to us is such a privilege. And like you mentioned earlier, like God can speak in a lot of different ways. And I think that that's really beautiful that his children are all so different that we hear from him in different ways. Like even if they're overall the same resounding message, like it's just so amazing. And just think about like the <coughs> creator of the universe of like all of the wonderful people like that we live with like wants to talk to us like is taking some of his even if it's not really a sacrifice for him but taking some of his time to talk to these creatures that are just gonna take advantage of this grace that we've been extended and just the thought of this all-powerful being just loves us so much it just it it blows my mind sometimes to just think about like I feel like I will never until I'm standing before him be able to really wrap my mind and my heart around what that actually is and that's a huge thing because I think the only things that we do know are the only things that we do know is essentially earthly knowledge like none of us here on earth know going on in heaven or going on with God because we can't experience it because it's of a whole different world. It's just, it's crazy. It's really, really, really crazy to think about because all the things that we do know here on earth, there's a whole different caliber of knowledge um, that is up in heaven. And I remember, I think it was, I think it was Adam. And I remember he was talking about like, during one of the Bible studies, he was talking about like how he looks at his dog sometimes and he's trying to open the door and then we can open the door so easily. But for the dog, it's the world's largest struggle. Like you can't open the door like, ha ha ha, you're so like dumb, you know? But for us, it's just like, you can turn it and then it opens. He was telling me, he's like, well, like I think God looks at us in the same way is like, we like we're struggling we can't struggle to open the door on his knowledge but he's laughing at us when we think we understand but there's no way in the world we can understand because his knowledge is so vast yeah that's i have so many questions for when we're finally in heaven and we just get to be with god i'm sure i'll forget all of them because i forget everything anyway but <laughs> just there's just so many things that the more I learn about things, the more I learn that I don't know, you know, there's like more, like I'm never going to know all of it. And so to me, that's just amazing. And I was going to, you were talking about kind of being so far from God and then coming back. And um, have you ever seen that everything skit? I'm going to leave a link to it down below in the video and podcast description because you guys need to go watch it. It's amazing. Um, it's to a song by Lifehouse. And I don't know if Lifehouse is a Christian band. I don't think they are. But it's about this girl. And so the Trinity is embodied in one man. And she's created by God. Um, and they dance together. And then eventually she gets um, like twirled off to this guy and then the guy dances with her and God is still reaching for her. And then she just goes through almost like symbolically like temptations. So there's um, somebody like with dollar bills that's just like making it rain <laughs> and she's like on the floor trying to pick all of them up and then he just grabs it out of her hands and then there's um, drinking 
and she's like, you know, vomiting, um, not for real. It's like, <laughs> it's symbolic. So there's no actual vomit. But, um, and then there's someone who's like a woman that's a model and makes her feel insecure about herself. And she, it looks like she develops an eating disorder. And then someone like this black shadowy figure with a knife and a gun comes to her and she's so far from God, like all of these temptations in between her and God is just reaching for her. And right as she's about to take her own life, she throws the gun down and starts trying to run through all of the temptations to get to God. Then God or Jesus um, eventually instead of trying to reach for her, runs in and puts himself between all of the temptations grabbing for her and just stands over her and she's just safe. And so it's just such an incredible, I saw it when I was in middle school and it just, it sounds really cheesy, but it was just so life-changing because I don't really connect with like acting very much just because it's not one of my main art forms, but it was just so powerful to actually see this enacted with actual people. I have to definitely check that out because it sounds very, very, very awe-inspiring. And just being able to see that being like reenacted, it's, it's such a powerful message. Yeah, it was, it was really wild because I remember my, one of my teachers saying like, if you have never had to run through all of the temptations, praise Jesus. But if you mm -hmm. have or you are, it's going to be okay. Like you're still redeemable. Okay guys, so that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, you can find all of these episodes in podcast form and other podcast episodes on createworshipinspire.com. Please be sure to comment down below with your favorite way that you encourage people and make them feel loved. And please be sure to leave any suggestions that you have for future videos. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, and share with a friend. And as always, if you'd like more CWI updates sooner than uploads, please be sure to follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. See you next time.